Thank you so much for coming. And uh, today this uh, talk, which is part of a series uh, presented from the Solid State Electronics Lab. Today's talk will focus on semiconductors and the hunt for renewable energy. Energy, uh, we use energy all the time. Uh, the lecture I'm giving is based on energy. The fact that you're all here is based on energy. This lecture will be on the internet. Everything requires energy. Uh, and energy is very much like wealth. Uh, like you open your wallet, you have some money in it. And if you have money, you can go places, you can do things, you can buy something, you can eat, uh, you can travel. So energy is almost exactly like wealth. It's very, very useful, very important. Um, and the search, use of energy, consumption of energy is very central to our lives. Energy in some ways makes our dreams come true. It, uh, so you see that it, Aladdin's lamp and energy is pretty much like that. It makes things happen, makes our dreams come true. So before I start the talk, I want to um, pay my respects to the source of energy. So I'm going to open this uh, little thing here that I have uh, because I'll be talking a lot about what is in here, which is of course, so this is the sun, right? so this is our source of energy, and almost everything we have uh, on the earth, all the energy we get in the earth, it comes from the sun. So, uh, and of course the sun is valued not just uh, now, we talk about solar energy, renewable energy, but for centuries and centuries, millennia, the sun has been worshipped in many cultures because it's recognized that it's the source of all our energy. Right? So, we'll talk a little bit more about the sun and uh, how semiconductors participate in that energy. So, moving to the next uh, slide. Uh, energy allows us to make change in our lives, it allows us to make a change and if you want to make a change we need some energy and allows us to take life journeys. So it's very much like breath and food. Without breath we cannot survive, uh, which is also using energy. Uh, without food we cannot survive and without energy we cannot survive. So our lifestyle, how we live depends on energy, our ability to move. Uh, a few generations ago, it was unheard of for somebody to travel overseas, go from one country to another. Only very privileged people had that opportunity. And now many of the students are from overseas. You can travel, you can ride, go on an airplane, you can take a car trip. So energy is very central to our mobility, which is very essential uh, to our lifestyle. Uh, it's also very central for food production, quality of food, and so on, right? uh, to solve the problem of hunger. Um, so energy plays a role in all our domains of our lives. So if you look at energy and quality of life, education, uh, students come to places like University of Michigan, without energy that cannot happen. Uh, employment, work is very tightly related to energy. Uh, having energy resources, consuming energy, very tightly coupled with employment. Um, if the energy costs become very high, it's a drain on the economy. Uh, the healthcare is very closely coupled to um, energy use and availability of energy. And of course, mobility, uh, where you can travel, which is very important for uh, us to explore our full potential, being able to be mobile. Right? So uh, in absence of mobility, we would walk, of course we'll walk, but we would just be traveling about a few miles from where we were born. Right? The fact that we can travel thousands of miles uh, to attend universities, to attend, take a job somewhere, it all depends on energy. So this is a very useful chart, many of you may have seen this, this is uh, provided by United Nations. Every year they look at all the countries, all the uh, countries that are willing to have them participate and rate the countries based on what they call the Human Development Index. And I want to uh, spend a little bit of time on this because it's plotted, this plot is plotted against energy consumption and this is in kilograms equivalent of oil and I'll convert it in joules a little, little later on uh, versus the, this index which can go from zero to one. Uh, to reach the high blue which are 
highest quality of life. Uh, the index takes into consideration three different uh, parameters. And uh, they're kind of uh, at a glance parameters. They may not be the best parameters, but that's a way of looking at some uh, quality of life. It considers three parameters, life expectancy. And if your life expectancy starts reaching in the 80s, you are in the blue. Uh, so you're up in this uh, category. Uh, education. So if your education is starting to reach about 16 years of education, uh, starting from kindergarten on into universities, uh, then again you start reaching. So all of these are needed. All three are needed to reach up at this level. And living standard, which is uh, the gross national income, it's represented through the gross national income. And if the gross national income starts reaching about $50,000 in equivalent purchasing power, which means in some countries where the purchasing power is higher, the number may be boosted to compensate for that. So if it starts reaching this level, you are in this uh, blue category. Okay? Uh, and one can argue, and is this an outmoded or is it a valid? This is what was used last year. These, these are the indices that were used last year. And uh, to some extent, they do capture uh, how the quality of life is, but one can uh, consider, well, these are probably not the best if all five, so the, the population that is left behind is about 80% of the population, more than 80%. So only about a billion people, a little less than a billion people have actually this high development index uh, and they consume a lot of energy, which I'll talk about in a moment. And the other five billion or so, more, more than five billion, are in the uh, low consumption category. And it's interesting to see how energy correlates. Uh, so energy correlates quite strongly with the UN uh, Development Index. But you notice also there's a big spread over here. So around this point, which is about 2,400 kilograms of oil equivalent, uh, there is like a sharp saturation that seems to occur. Uh, so United States, where we are now, uh, is at this point. And this point converts, if you look in joules, now these numbers often don't mean anything uh, when they're converted, but this comes to about 300 gigajoules per person per year in the US. Okay. Um, now, there are countries that are down here, which actually have a very high quality of life, but consume one third of that. Right? So simply energy cons uh, consumption is not an indication Iceland consumes a lot, but of course, Iceland is rated number one in last year's uh, uh, HDI tabulation. Uh, so it seems like energy does relate, but then beyond a certain point, the quality of life tends to saturate. And it's hard to go uh, beyond this uh, point. So around here, and you can see some uh, countries consuming very little. Uh, but still having a very high quality of life based on this criterion. Right? And what I'm going to talk about also, because energy is so central to quality of life, that w is this a good criterion? Right? Uh, because this, uh, this is one of the widely used tables to promote energy consumption, to connect energy with quality of life, and find resources for energy. Uh, so it's important to understand you know, how much sense does it make and does it capture the full essence of a quality of life. Right? So I'll a little later describe to you the seven layers of quality of life, which include these, but go beyond. For example, some energy consumption is very high in certain kinds of uh, consumption. So for example, if, it's, if you want to live in a very big house, it's very energy intensive. Um, other things you can enjoy if you want to just have fun with friends, it may not be that energy intensive. Right? So it's important to look at um, this plot, it's a valid plot, but also go beyond it and see how much of the energy as, kept, as described in this uh, energy consumption described in this chart, how much of it is valid um, and can we go beyond um, these three simple criteria. So, also, one notices that the gross domestic product, uh, this is a global chart worldwide, uh, how energy consumption correlates very strongly with GDP. 
So energy is very central. Uh, to make anything, you need energy. Right? Uh, to drive somewhere, to go someplace, you need energy. So these charts show that energy is very central in almost everything we do. Uh, so in the US, and this is in 2007, uh, the energy expense was about $1.2 trillion. Just energy, obtaining energy and the revenue from energy companies. The GDP at that time was about $14 trillion. So clearly, energy is very important. So there's a factor of almost 12 gain. You spend energy to produce products, produce services, and there's a factor of 10 or 12 uh, gain in the amount of money you spend on energy and the GDP that is, it produces. Okay. In the US, the consumption of energy in terms of gallons, so this is an equivalent gallon. Of course, we don't consume 10 gallons per day. But the amount of energy we consume in this country per person per day is about 10 gallons of gasoline worth that. Out of which maybe a, a gallon or so is used in transportation and the rest is used in home heating, cooling and so on. Right? Food we eat is related to energy. And I'll describe this breakdown in a moment. So the first part of the talk, I'm just going to talk about energy, its importance, uh, its relevance and some of the consequences of obtaining energy and using energy. <clears throat> so, we're switching from energy. Uh, energy is used to take a journey. Right? Energy by itself is just like dollars. If you have dollars, you can't eat them. Uh, you can't heat yourself with dollars. You have to spend it on doing something. You have to make energy do something and make it useful. So, energy is used in uh, taking journeys in life. Right? So, if I want to go from point A to point B, I need energy. Right? And the journeys could be of any kind and all of us are constantly taking journeys in life. Um, we want to go and meet friends, have a cup of coffee with our friends, uh, we may want to travel somewhere to see something. Uh, so we are constantly taking journeys in life. Right? You guys have come here, um, that was a journey. Uh, so we are constantly taking journeys in life. And even obtaining fuel, obtaining energy is a process. Right? So any process can be called a journey. Uh, so when we take a journey, uh, one can say the journey has uh, three parts, three parts to it. Uh, one is we have a fruit, we have some destination. We want to gain something from the journey, so we'll call it fruit. So you want to accomplish something. You come to the university, you want to get trained, you want to learn something. So that's a fruit of the journey. Okay? So the first part is, of course, that's our goal. The reason we are spending energy is to have some fruit. Uh, so that fruit is of course very important. To take the journey we need some fuel to power the journey. But there's always a residue to the journey also, which is very important to recognize. Right? So there are these three ele elements are very important. The fruit of the journey, the fuel that I need to take the journey, and the residue of the journey. And every journey has some residue. Now there may be some ideal journeys which have no residue, but almost every journey has a residue. So you drive a car, there's a carbon, carbon emission that comes out, that's a residue. Uh, if I eat some food, and I, I have a little thing here, so if I eat something, uh, the residue is, I have to clean that residue. So I have here, uh, I'm a great promoter of dental health, so I have a floss, a toothbrush. And so when you eat, there's a residue left in your mouth, you have to clean your mouth. So in any journey, these three important points always have to be in front. And fuel is as important as the residue. Right? So if your residue, because to mitigate the residue, you also need fuel. Right? So take your journey, you need fuel, and to mitigate the residue, you need fuel. And if the residue starts becoming so large, the journey becomes unsustainable. Right? So if you're starting to leave residue, and the residue piles up like this. This is actually a strike in Italy uh, of the garbage collectors. They, they went on strike and you can see the residue is piled up and the streets become impossible. Right? So the same thing can happen if the residue starts becoming so large that to mitigate and overcome the residue, there is so much energy that has to be put into it, then the journey starts becoming unsustainable. Right? And so how the journey is taken, how the fuel is produced is all as important as using uh, 
obtaining the fruit. So what we want in the journey, obviously, is we want to maximize the fruit. Because that's the goal. That's our, uh, the reason we are taking a journey. Right? Uh, we want to minimize the fuel that we are using for the journey. And we want to minimize the residue that is pr being produced. So one has to keep an eye on all three elements when we use energy. Right? Uh, the residue could be personal. Uh, if I eat, if I overeat, I may uh, become ill. If I eat foods that are not suitable to my body, I may become ill. So they may taste great. So the fruit is great, but it may leave a residue that makes my body unhealthy. Right? So one has to have all three elements. The residue could be personal, could be local, like garbage dumped in the street. Uh, it could also be global. So, for example, a lot of the impact on the climate, for example, by the journeys we are taking is also a residue. Right? So one has to keep an eye when using energy on all these three elements. So in the hunt for energy, and that's what this uh, topic is, in the hunt for energy, it's very important to consider what is the residue that is being produced. And we all know this residue. Uh, so this residue is not necessary to be produced. It's not like nature says this residue has to be there. But some momentarily, if there are some accidents, lapses, you can have these residues. Right? So like the um, <coughs> deep water horizon accident that occurred uh, last year, uh, the Fukushima disaster, uh, as well as even some ways of mining coal. So clear uh, cut mining where you're just stripping mountains and mining. That can also leave a residue uh, in the environment. So residue is part of the production, obtaining, the, and even war. A lot of the wars are, if one delves into it, a lot of wars are going on, may have a lot of the origin in searching for energy, acquiring energy. Because energy is so central to society's wellness and to human wellness. So one has to anticipate, avoid, prepare, and mitigate the residue. So as we use uh, energy, keeping an eye on the residue is as important as actually using the energy. <clears throat> In our personal journeys, there are also residues. Right? So in the personal journeys, there are also residues. Um, the food can leave a residue of um, the body becoming heavy. Uh, a lot of diseases are related to the foods we eat. And in fact, in the Western countries or the developed countries, um, most of the illnesses today are lifestyle illnesses. Uh, if one looks at 50, 60, 70 years ago, most of the illnesses were illnesses we didn't understand. Scientifically, they were not understood. Their cures were not there. Their drugs were not there. So illnesses were like malaria, cholera, um, those kind of illnesses. But now in developed countries, the, the countries I showed you which had this high uh, human Development Index, the illnesses that are there are almost entirely lifestyle illnesses. Right? So from uh, being stationary, sitting in a desk all day, illnesses of the back pain, uh, illnesses that are related to overconsumption of food, illnesses that are related to other things like depression, they're almost all lifestyle illnesses and they are residue, they're, they can be called the residue because if you don't understand something then of course one can say well, 100 years ago, we didn't understand why polio was there. We didn't understand why smallpox or these illnesses were there. But now we do. And so the illnesses that we see are primarily lifestyle illnesses. And they are the residue of the way we consume. Uh, and they can actually be overwhelming. And we see uh, that in many countries, healthcare is starting to become unsustainable because the residue of the living is, has become so high that the cost of mitigating that residue is starting to be comparable to the energy we are spending and the fruit we are gaining. So the residue removal can involve more than the fuel that was actually used for the journey. So whether it's pollution, obesity, garbage, uh, so heart surgery, uh, a lot of the heart diseases are related to our consumption, the way we eat. Uh, so one has to ask what is the journey for and it's very important when you take, when we uh, look at journeys in life, the fruit is very important, but also looking at the residue is equally important. And the mitigating of the residue is very important, especially for this talk, because I'm going to talk about semiconductor technologies, which are very useful in mitigating the residue. 
So one has to ask what are the journeys I'm taking? What is good life? So I've talked about this in the last talks also. One has to question what is good life? Because to achieve the good life, one has to spend energy. Energy is the cost of the good life. And if the idea of good life differs, changes, our energy consumption can also change. So it's not a guarantee that to achieve good life, like in this country, we consume 300 gigajoules of energy per year. That doesn't guarantee we'll get good life. You could get a better life with less or more. Right? So one has to see what is my definition of good life. So that's as critical as energy. So energy is very closely coupled. And so if the concept of good life here, this is a picture of a ski resort in Dubai. Right? So a ski resort in Dubai. Now that is a desert. Right? That's a desert. And so one, if one wants this kind of lifestyle, it's a very expensive lifestyle. So you can, that's the power of energy, it can create magic. Right? So who could ever imagine that in 120 degrees you could be skiing in snow inside. But the cost of that journey is very, very expensive. So taking the journey and deciding, you know, what is the journey I'm going to take. If you have a very big house, if you're living in 50,000 square foot home, it's going to be very expensive. And one has to ask, what is the fruit? Is the fruit commensurate with the energy I'm spending? And that question is becoming more and more important as all six billion of us want a good life. So that is an important question for individuals to ask because I am myself paying. If I, if I have a big house, I'm paying for the heating of the big house. Right? So that's a part of individual question, but also part of the society's question and the culture. Uh, if the culture promotes that in the desert you have to ski, that's going to be very expensive. Right? If the culture promotes that, no, in the desert, uh, you enjoy something else, right? and that's less expensive. So how we deal with energy starts with how we define our quality of, how we define our good life. So uh, I've talked about these seven layers of good life, and the uh, view graph or the, or the slide I showed you just a moment ago contained a slice of that element, but not all of it. So here are the seven layers of good life. The first layer is just physical wellness. Right? So it's a material wellness. Uh, a good house, sheltered house, a good physique, uh, health care, all those are part of physical wellness. So having physical wellness, and this is a more expensive because it requires a lot of energy to be physically well. The second layer is creative wellness, being creative in your life. Uh, if you devote yourself to creativity, the cost, energy cost is not that high. Right? For example, if you write a poetry, uh, you don't need to consume five gallons of uh, gasoline to write poetry. Right? The cost is very little. So as you go up from different layers of uh, wellness or quality of life, the, the first layer, the physical layer, sensual pleasures are very expensive. If, if you want to derive pleasure from having a huge palace, it's very expensive. If you want to derive pleasure from being an artist, it's not as expensive. Yet the fruit might, might be equally delicious. Right? So it's very important in looking at energy to understand all these seven elements. So third element is having a multidimensional role in life, having a role where you're doing many, many things. And there's a pleasure in that versus being one dimensional. Uh, the next element is love. Right? Uh, if you have love in your life, that's a very high quality of life. It's not captured in the human, in the development index I mentioned to you. Like United Nations doesn't ask, do you have love in your life? It says, you know, what's your life expectancy? How many years of education? And what's your income? Right? But there's nothing about having friends. Right? Now that's very important because that doesn't require a lot of energy, but it's very, very satisfying. Then being able to express yourself, having ability to express yourself freely. Right? So political expression or expression of any other kind, that is also part of the quality of good life, does not require a high cost of energy. Uh, then self-reflection, meditation, understanding yourself. And finally, this last one, being connected, being feeling, enjoying being part of the universe is a red dwarf to represent that, right? So if one looks at all these seven layers of 
wellness or quality of high quality of life, the highest cost is of course down here and the lowest cost is down here. And that's very important to understand and as we move forward, uh, the culture, because we are so connected with the culture, we are so impacted by the culture, if the culture starts adjusting that yeah, you can get a great quality of life by having friends, in addition to this, because this is of course a given, you have to have good physical structure, right? you have to have good health, because if your health care is not there, you're sick all the time, the rest of it just falls apart. Right? So this is a given, it requires a lot of energy, but seeking pleasures in life purely through this is very expensive, and seeking pleasures in other aspects is less expensive. Uh, but it's an individual choice. But the important thing is one has to understand there are these higher layers which don't require a lot of uh, energy cost, they don't require burning a lot of fuel, uh, and they can provide a lot of. So this one is important and I'll start talking about some of the energy issues related to physical wellness. So when we consume, and this is also another thing that is very important, in engineering we see this all the time. Uh, the fruit versus consumption plot. Right? Uh, so if you design a transistor, for example, if you design a transistor, you look at the gain of the transistor uh, versus the injected current, but this is a generic plot. It's valid for almost anything, but of course in engineering it's a very important plot. When the input is small, when the consumption is very small, and one can understand this uh, by looking at an uh, example of say food, eating. Right? So if you're eating only four or five hundred calories a day, then your health is really poor, right? So you hardly have energy to even walk. And around about say a couple of thousand calories of so, your quality of life, your health starts becoming much better, right? So there's a lower threshold you have to exceed in consumption before you start reaching a high quality of life. Then your quality sort of saturates. So if I eat 2,000 calories or eat, I eat 3,000 calories, I'm not going to be any better physically. I have the same quality of life, I have the same health. My health is not going to go better if instead of 2,000 calories I double my calories. Right? My health is not going to get better. And that's true of other consumption also. Right? If I start at, uh, if I look at a house, if I have a 100 square foot home, I'm living in pretty bad shape. Like if I have a family and I, my house is only 100 square feet, we have to live on top of each other. Right? But if I have say a 1500 square foot home, and then I double it or triple it or quadruple it, it doesn't add anything to my quality of life. So the fruit doesn't increase, the fruit saturates. And then beyond a certain point, the fruit collapses. Right? So if I start eating 10,000 calories a day, I'm going to be so obese, can't walk, can't do anything, and I'm going to just be as bad as if I didn't eat anything. So this is a very useful plot to look at in terms of energy consumption. And you can see that in the Human Development Index I showed you. The saturation of the HDI, the Human Development Index, as a function of consumption. So this is very useful to have in mind as we consume. Personally, as well as, and, and this is an interesting, uh, this is a global, this is a worldwide, uh, observation in 2008, the number of people suffering from diseases related to overconsumption of food exceeded the number of people suffering from underconsumption of food, right? which is an amazing fact that in 2008, and this is not just in developed countries, worldwide, worldwide more people suffered from ill health because they are eating too much versus those who are suffering from malnutrition. Now, of course, the poor people are suffering and technology and societies have to, but also people who are over consuming are suffering. Right? So there are people here on this side of the threshold and there are people here on this side of the threshold. And in 2008, this group became larger than the group that was on the lower side. Of course, it's never happened throughout the human history. And that's part of technology coming into picture that so many people are on this side. So ideally, what journey we take, so I'm going to come to energy, but first energy is so important that I'm talking about a lot of other things uh, which are 
kind of implicitly related to energy. So when we take a journey, we want the maximum fruit, minimum energy, and minimum residue. That's our goal. We don't want to have a lot of residue. We don't want to consume. So looking at a car journey as a metaphor. Right? So if you can look at a car journey, because we all take car journeys and we enjoy them. So the fruit of the car journey is the joy of the open road, meeting our family, meeting our friends. We travel for Thanksgiving. We travel for all kinds of holidays and we have so much fun. Right? So that's the fruit of the journey. Uh, of course, there's a cost to the journey. Right? Uh, and you can drive a, you know, a, a small car to your journey, or you can decide I'm going to drive a bus to the journey, or I can drive a tank to the journey. Right? So the fuel is important as well. Right? So, but then there's a residue. Right? If you're not mindful when you're taking a journey, you could, get a, you could speed, get a ticket, right? uh, your license uh, will get some points, your insurance will go up high. You can uh, get a flat tire. So these are some of the residues. Uh, you can have a crash. Right? If you're not mindful, right? so uh, a car journey provides a lot of fun, but it can also provide a lot of uh, uh, kind of sorrow, and your car may eventually get beat up. Right? So there's a residue. So and that's true of every journey. So one of the, the next slide I'm going to show you is what is the way to take the journey with the least amount of energy and the maximum amount of fruit, least amount of residue. And this is a path, and this, this comes from yoga. Right? So one of the things that I'll talk about is that if you study the concepts of yoga, it addresses this question, even though 5,000 years ago, that was probably not a rel you know, question that was on everybody's mind. But it's a very relevant question now. And it's interesting to see that 5,000 years ago, yoga provided a, a sort of a thought process and a set of best practices to address exactly this question. Uh, so, and that concept is captured in what is called ashtang, eight limbs of doing something, eight, way, eight tools to take a journey with this goal. Right? So it's very interesting that 5,000 years ago this uh, concept was presented and it is a best practices concept, right? How do you do something to optimize it? So these are the eight rules. Uh, and I, I'm going to apply them to the car journey, but they're applicable to anything. So first is knowledge. So the first thing before you take a journey is knowledge. Have the knowledge, have the rules of the road for a car journey. Know what are the speed limits, how do you drive, what are, so you don't got, get caught by a police person, policeman, uh, don't get fined, uh, don't exceed the speed limits, uh, drive where you're supposed to drive, don't drive on the you know, bike path, uh, those kind of things. Uh, the second thing is infrastructure. Have the right infrastructure and tools to take the journey. Right? Uh, have a car that works. Have the roads that work. Go on roads that are good. Uh, don't drive in a, in a field. Right? So just to cut corners, don't drive through a field because you'll get stuck. Uh, then how do you respond to the stress of the journey? Right? So that's a very important part of taking any journey. How do you respond to the stress? How does your car respond to the stress? How do you yourself respond to the stress? of the journey. Then fuel for the journey. Right? So we are talking about fuel, but other things are equally important. Fuel for the journey. And then also having awareness of your strength as a driver, awareness of your car, the condition of your brakes, the condition of your sensors, uh, making sure the gas tank doesn't go empty in between uh, gas stations. Awareness of the road. Other cars, pedestrians, so you can prevent getting into accidents, because that's a huge residue. Uh, next, mindfulness, right? So mindfulness, which is the seventh element of the uh, journey, uh, which is represented by maps, GPS system, uh, understanding speed limits, and all those things. And finally, releasing. This is the eighth limb of this journey, uh, releasing the residue of the journey, because the residue of the journey could be anything. So it, it might be that somebody you know, uh, did something bad to you, and you have this intense anger, that's, that person cut me off, that's a road rage, and you're holding it in your head, and your journey is becoming, you can't enjoy your fruit, because the residue has overtaken your pleasure. So letting go, that's a very important part of yoga, uh, and of course it's very relevant to us, because we talk about residue. So if you're, if you're driving a laser, for example, uh, the residue of the laser might be heat, you have to get rid of the heat. Otherwise, the laser will burn out. Right? So having ability to let go of the residue. Right? So these are the eight 
limbs, but they are very relevant because they are generic, they are universal principles of taking any journey. From knowledge all the way to letting go. Right? Um, and of course the fuel in between. Okay, so now let's talk, talk talking about energy. So the, all our energy, I, I mentioned, I showed you this uh, beautiful uh, painting of the sun. So this is the sun. All our energy comes from this wonderful source um, through this fusion reaction. Right? So, uh, and you may have seen all this. So hydrogen fusing into producing helium and uh, Fusion, which is one of the you know, uh, kind of holy grails of energy on the earth as well. Uh, people have been trying to get fusion, contained fusion going on for decades now with really no success. There's no commercial fusion reactor. Uh, but this is a very clean way of getting energy provided you can contain the fusion. On the earth we've not been able to do that. Right? So we can make bombs, we can make nuclear bombs, but we can't have as yet a power station based on fusion. Uh, now on the sun, 4.2 billion kilograms of mass are converted to energy per second. That's the kind of energy. So you all know the E equal to mc square law. On the sun, that law is being used and 4.2 billion kilograms, and it's a huge amount of energy that is coming out of the sun and it's coming all over. It's just emanating everywhere. Right? And we get a slice of that onto the earth and all of earth's energy is from here. Right? So the fossil fuels we use from thousands of years ago which are buried in the ground to solar energy being used concurrently, everything comes from the sun. Right? Now how much power comes, it's amazing. So I just mentioned to you this uh, billions of kilograms being converted into energy through fusion. So that ends up 3.8 times 10 to the 26 watts. Now of course nobody can grasp this. I certainly can't grasp what this number means, uh, but it's a big number. So a huge amount of power is coming from the sun. Now the power that reaches the earth is 10 to the 17 watts. Right? Uh, and if you contrast this to the US power consumption, which is 4 times 10 to the 12 watts, right? This is on the earth. The power that is received on the US geographical area is about 10 to the 15 watts, right? average power. Uh, now we only consume less than half a percent of that. Right? But of course this power goes into uh, you know, warming, goes into our crops, goes into all kinds of things. Uh, but just as a comparison point, we receive 10 to the 15 watts continuously or averaged over the day from the sun on the US and US is one of the highest energy consuming societies and yet even in the US that consumption is a fraction of a percent, 0.4 percent of what is received. Now of course that doesn't mean that there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it just means that there is enormous amount of energy coming in and of course converting that energy into usable energy is a big challenge right? and semiconductors play a big role and they'll play a bigger and bigger role which is part of the talk that uh, we're going to talk about. So on the earth about a thousand watts uh, come per square meter. Right? So per square meter about a thousand watts come. Now an individual human like ourselves we consume about a hundred watt of power to live. Right? So as you're sitting here, I'm talking, I may be consuming a little more uh, than you, but on average, a human being consumes hundred watts of power to live. Right? So our body's factory uh, to survive, to live, uh, we consume about hundred watts. Now on one square meter, which is just three feet by three feet, one square meter, right? which is interestingly uh, about the, you know, just the area a little larger than our body, uh, a thousand watts come from the sun. We only need hundred watts per, to survive. Now of course that's the energy we need to survive, bare survival, that doesn't mean that's what we consume. We consume much more than that. Right? So let's take a look. Uh, so we'll, we'll start looking at energy now in a little more detail and from a little more physics point of view. Just because energy is there doesn't mean we can, we can use it. Right? So that's where uh, some of the technologies come in. 
uh, having energy doesn't mean you can use energy. So in energy, when one looks at it from a point of view of use and conversion of energy, terms that are quite important are is total energy, which we all understand, then usable energy, what we can actually use. Uh, and that's a, there, there can be a big a difference between the two. So energy is needed to create the force to take any journey. Right? Uh, now physics also tells us that energy is conserved. Right? Uh, now of course energy and mass are conserved, but usually in, in the earth mass doesn't change, so energy is conserved. However, the usable energy is not conserved. And that's a big challenge for people who work in energy that even though energy is conserved, the usable energy is continuously lost and has to be replenished. So if I'm getting, if I have 100 watts, I can't just use 100 watts to do whatever I want. The amount of energy I may be able to use could be much smaller. And that's where um, we know from experience that energy is lost. So if you drive a car, you can't say, well, energy is conserved, so your car gas should be there forever. That's not the case. We lose um, we have to fill our gas tank again. If we eat, we become hungry again. So even though total energy is conserved, the usable energy is not conserved. And energy, as you know, is a scalar, while taking a journey requires a certain direction. Right? And that conversion process causes loss of usable energy. Right? And also part of the reason we, use, we lose usable energy is that nature is quite unbiased. Nature doesn't care which journey we are taking. Even though we would love to have nature care about our journeys, nature is unbiased. Right? And that plays a very important role in thermodynamics. So th this is a kind of a lay person's way of saying thermodynamics applies. Right? So if you look at this usable and non-usable energy, uh, the person who figures very strongly in this whole concept is uh, this French scientist, uh, Carnot, who whose name is on the Carnot engine, which is the most efficient way of converting heat energy to mechanical energy right, to, for an engine, which, uh, which is then used to produce electricity, produce cars, the, the way the cars move. So he provided, and of course it was uh, then improved, he provided the pathway or the mathematics behind how you go from one point in your uh, journey to another and produce mechanical energy in this particular case. So what he f uh, found was that the efficiency, which means efficiency is the usable energy. So you put some energy into it, you get some work out of it, and you transfer some energy somewhere else. So this ratio from this energy you're putting into the work is given by 1 minus the temperature on this side, which is the cold temperature over one of the temperature on this side, which is the hot temperature. And on the earth, typically the way we use fuel, this number is about 40%. So when we convert energy from say burning coal or gasoline or other or natural gas, the efficiency of usable energy or converting energy is about 40%. And that's the limit. Right? So if the, that's the process we are using, that's the limit. There's not much we can do about it. Right? because Nature says that's the limit. So in some uh, uh, journeys, the efficiency of the use is set by nature. In other journeys, the efficiency of the use may be set by something else. So a large part of our energy production depends on this cycle, Carnot cycle. And the efficiency is about 40%. Which means if I use uh, 100 joules of energy, I can only get 40 joules to do what I want to do. The rest of the 60 joules is residue in some form. Could be heat, could be other chemicals coming out, carrying away energy, and this is limited by thermodynamics. And since this is one of the most important sources of energy we use. Right? Now, of course, if we change it, it could be very different. Right? But right now, the way we use energy, this is the dominant mathematics that determines how energy is used. Uh, I have here uh, something that comes again. Uh, I have sources to all this at the end of the presentation uh, because obviously I didn't gather all this information. Uh, 
Uh, if you look at electricity generation, like electricity is a very useful form of energy because it's very efficient. Once you have electricity, you can convert it into uh, mechanical energy with almost 100% efficiency. But not into everything else. But if you look at the electricity generation efficiency, uh, hydroelectric has the highest efficiency because it's already a mechanical energy. So it's already directional. So converting hydroelectric to electricity is very, very efficient, 90%. Yeah. But if you look at how most of our electricity comes in most developed countries, it comes from actually burning fuel, from coal, from gas, from other such sources. Uh, and that efficiency, as I mentioned, is limited by the Carnot cycle, which is about 30 to 40%. So if you can see over here, this is the 50% mark, and most of our sources are actually very inefficient. Only hydroelectric is the uh, source that has this very high efficiency, or, or any other directional. So mechanical to mechanical, obviously, is very high. Uh, so most of our sources come from burning fuel, turning turbines, and then the turbine used to can produce electricity, and that's very low that you can see over here. So I'll show you this next chart, which is um, basically summarizing in very uh, simple language uh, what happens. Uh, so when you're taking a journey, it's like driving in LA this, or, or any other big city, and there are like hundreds of exits, and you're in a panic mode, and you take the wrong exit. So that's what often, what, that's why the efficiency is 60%. The energy is oozing into situation, into pathways that you don't really want. Right? It's like driving and then getting lost in this maze. So you have forks coming in, in your pathway, and once in a while you're taking the wrong exit and you lose your energy. Okay? So that's why the efficiency on the earth for most uh, conversion of the kind I showed you is about 30 to 40%. Um, <clears throat> now, in the case of thermodynamics, if you burn something, that efficiency is limited by thermodynamics rules, laws, which are physical laws. Right? In other journeys, the loss of efficiency is due to mindfulness or lack of mindfulness. And that can be actually corrected. Right? Thermodynamic losses cannot be corrected because that's set by nature. Other losses can be corrected because they're not based on nature, nature's law, they're based on mindfulness or lack of mindfulness. Right? So they can be corrected and semiconductor technologies are very powerful in correcting them. Right? So for example, if you are on this maze of uh, highways, it's not thermodynamics that is saying you're going to take a wrong exit, it's your lack of mindfulness. If you don't have a map, you'll get lost. Right? But you can have a map. You can have a GPS system. You can have a, a car that is driverless, which you'll have in uh, another few years which will absolutely not take the wrong exit. Right? So some areas you can correct for the efficiency, but in some areas it's set by thermodynamics. So here is a very uh, widely used, this is from Lawrence Livermore National Lab, which shows the US energy consumption from all sources and where it goes. But the bottom line is US uh, uses about, this is 94.6 quads. A quad is about 10 to the 18 joules. Right? About 10 to the 18 joules. So this is about 10 to the 20 joules. That's what we consume in the US. Right? And that comes to about 300 gigajoules per person. Uh, out of this close to 100, so it's 95 or so, uh, and now it's closer to 100. But out of this, the energy that is actually used is only 39.9, so about 40 from all sources. Because remember, some of the sources are very efficient. Some are inefficient. But overall, 60%, so you can see over here, rejected, which is what they call rejected energy, 54.64. So out of 94, 54 is rejected, which means it's unusable. It either produces heat or produces residue, and it's unusable. Right? Only about 40 is actually going into something usable. And out of this 40, much smaller, even a smaller number is actually used in producing. And I'll show you um, in a moment what happens to lighting by following a same similar path to light that we get in our houses. 
So there's a huge inefficiency in the use of nature, uh, new use of energy. And once again, just to finish this, this is energy consumption in a US house. So just in the home, we use about 130 gigajoules. Uh, in transportation, we use about 100. Uh, production of food also consumes energy, right? So it, it's about this. Uh, and where the energy goes, it's mostly going into, you can see, uh, heating and cooling, uh, various aspects of that. Right? So let's start talking more about uh, what semiconductors can do. Right? So semiconductors can impact in many ways. So what I've done so far in this talk is provide you sort of a basis of where energy is coming from, how it's being used, where the inefficiencies are. And of course, semiconductors have many roles in this technology because they're remarkable materials, which I'll talk about in a moment. So where the opportunities are, uh, at the moment, only 8.3% of our sources are renewable. The rest are not renewable. So they may be coal, they, which means they're not reversible. And once the, residue, once the residue is there, it's very expensive to regain what we've lost. Uh, nearly 60% of the energy is lost due to inefficiency in the technology or nature demands that the, the efficiency is limited by nature. Uh, and the residue from energy use is high. So that offers us what can semiconductors do, which is really the main purpose of looking at semiconductors. So semiconductors, I think all of you understand, it's a it's semiconductor material with you have a filled band with electrons and an unfilled band. Right? And uh, that can lead to intelligent technologies, transistors, uh, almost everything we have which is intelligent to lasers, displays, everything is based on semiconductors. But from the point of view of energy, what can semiconductors do? So there are several categories which semiconductors can contribute. The first and very important is of course energy conversion itself. Right? And uh, of course, all of you are familiar with now because there's so much in the literature and in the press about uh, uh, solar cells uh, converting photons to electrons and holes. So directly converting sunlight uh, to electrons and holes. Right? And I'll talk about that. Uh, then another important role for semiconductors, which is becoming more and more important, is artificial photosynthesis. Because photosynthesis is a process where the green leaves uh, convert sunlight into fuel. Right? And of course, that fuel is the basis of all fossil fuel eventually. Coal, fossil fuel, gasoline, all of that is through natural photosynthesis done over thousands of years. Now, if one can speed up that photosynthesis, so instead of taking uh, years to grow a tree, if the energy could be captured in minutes, Obviously, that's a huge source. And there's a lot of interesting research. It's not at a point where it's commercial, although <clears throat> it is starting to get to the point where there's a tremendous opportunity for semiconductors. And I'll describe what semiconductors do uh, in that. Solar cells, of course, a, a well-known technology. You can buy solar panels. Um, and gradually, they're coming, becoming more and more important. Then the other aspect, so this is just energy conversion. Right? So it's semiconductors providing energy conversion. The second is energy efficiency. Right? And we'll, we'll, I'll just take a look at solid state lighting. Uh, in an arbor, uh, the street lights are now solid state lighting. They're based on semiconductors. Right? Uh, and they have very high efficiency of conversion uh, compared to, say, incandescent bulbs, which are being phased out. Then also energy efficiency in delivery of energy, okay? uh, which forms a part of smart grid. So in the distribution system of energy, uh, in electricity in particular, almost 10, more than 10% of energy is lost in the distribution. Right? Uh, and so smart grid diverting energy where it's needed because electricity is something you can't just store. You have to use it. You have to send it out wherever it's needed. So intelligent systems that use, so unlike many other sources, electricity is not something that you can say, OK, I'm just going to store it, hold on to it for a while. You have to constantly use it produce it and use it. Uh, so smart grids, also electric vehicles, uh, which uh, themselves, so it's not that electricity is very efficient to produce. It's not efficient, but it's an important source. So making it efficient is a role where semiconductors can play. They are already playing an important role. 
then energy monitoring systems. Uh, so for example, climate control systems in the home, also monitoring systems for cars. Um, of course, semiconductors are also already part of the uh, modern automobile. Uh, there are more microprocessors and electronics there than <coughs> in many, uh, in fact, even in labs that we have. So there's so much electronics already in the car, but much more is bound to come. Then what I call coherent paths, um, and I'll talk about this, uh, where your actions are in coherence. And I'll talk about that towards the end of the talk. So all these areas are where semiconductors can make a very important impact, not just in energy conversion, but in these all, all these areas. So as energy sources, the principle is very simple. Light shines on a semiconductor, produces electrons and holes, and if you have a diode, uh, you can sweep the electrons and holes and you can collect current, you can co collect electric current, but primarily you have electrons and holes that are produced and those electrons and holes can be used for electric power to produce electricity, uh, drive, do whatever you want with the electricity. It can also, electrons and holes are also important for the oxidation reduction chemistry of chemicals. Right? So you can also drive chemical reactions just like they can drive uh, and, and produce light back uh, or use electricity for anything else, you can also use the same electrons and holes to create oxidation reduction uh, chemistry, which is the basis for artificial leaves, artificial leaf, artificial photosynthesis. And semiconductors are an important player in that technology because you basically have sunlight coming and just like the uh, <coughs> leaf converts it into fuel, the same process can be done by a diode where you're converting photons from the sun into hydrocarbons or hydrogen, right? So water splitting and so on. Uh, so very quickly, this is the solar spectrum and this is the, so it's like a black body radiation. And uh, what is also shown here, this part of the spectrum, uh, which is converted by crystalline uh, silicon. Uh, so solar power, just this is just a repetition, uh, we get a lot of energy. Now in solar cells, uh, and this is just a quick uh, summary of solar cells, uh, because I'm just going to give you a review. Uh, below the band gap, the photons that come below band gap are transmitted, so we can't collect them. The photons that are above the band gap, energy above the band gap is lost as heat, and just the band gap energy is collected. But with that, one loses some of the energy, but you get uh, still a lot of uh, power. Um, the maximum power you can get from a single semiconductor solar cell is about 33% and that's called the shockley quasar limit. Uh, and that depends on the band gap. So it occurs about uh, around 1.3 electron volt band gap. Right? Most of our solar cells are not at that point. So silicon is the most widely used in gallium arsenide. Uh, but they can easily, a high quality silicon solar cell can give about 22-23%. But most of the silicon that is used in commercial solar cells is not high quality silicon because it's very expensive. So low cost uh, silicon gives more like 12-13%. Uh, right? And that technology is starting to become uh, economically feasible. In one other words, of course it's a renewable because you can uh, there's no residue of, there's no gas, there's no chemical reaction, you're not burning anything. Um, <clears throat> and the primary, uh, whether it gets inserted, as it gets inserted is a commercial, it's an economic challenge. Right? So now of course uh, solar panels are made and flat and the prices of solar panels is dropping because it's a worldwide market now and a lot of companies are competing. Uh, this is just a cost, because cost is driving this technology. The technology is there, right? cost is driving this technology. And at this point, at this point in 2012, silicon, amorphous silicon and polycrystalline silicon thin film technology is starting to become competitive with many sources of energy. Now here you can see in niche markets where this is a solar sail, and I understand that uh, it's used in a harbor in Hong Kong to bring people to the gambling centers. Uh, so this is a, you know, interesting. Uh, now, in some applications, solar cells are already becoming very important. Right? 
But even in developed countries where solar energy has to compete with other sources, right? if you don't have other sources, of course, solar energy leapfrogs technology, right? uh, like in, in uh, developing countries, which I'll mention in a moment. But so the impact is very high in less developed countries where you don't have the infrastructure of existing power plants and subsidies and so on. But even in developed countries where you have all that, so entrenched technology you've got to compete with, uh, solar cells and solar technology is starting to become competitive. And as it is going forward, it will become uh, competitive. Now in this country, solar, cell, solar technology is just less than a percent of our energy. But in certain other countries, like certain northern European countries, the energy coming from these renewable sources, especially this uh, uh, solar cell technology, is actually becoming significant. In other words, they're starting to reach 5 to 10 percent levels. So it's very significant. Uh, now, if one looks at uh, the next place uh, where semiconductors are going to become, become more and more important is this artificial photosynthesis process, which is basically mimicking what nature does. And all our sources of energy are from this, at some point, all the fossil fuels from the... So here, one is producing electrons and holes, but they're not being collected in a circuit, but they are used to drive chemical reactions. And that's what the leaf is also doing. The leaf has a very complex, developed over millions of years, very elaborate chemistry process where the photons produce oxidation reduction and you have hydrocarbons. Right? And this is now being done in the lab and there are a number of labs around the country which are producing very uh, high quality artificial photosynthesis. There are a number of companies that are coming into this uh, arena. It's not at the level of solar cells but it's the same kind of uh, principle where you're using semiconductors. So the photons are converted to electrons and holes and oxidation and reduction to cause photosynthesis, which basically eats up carbon dioxide uh, to produce high carbon hydrates and oxygen. Uh, <clears throat> now the challenges here are to find reliable catalysts. Now nature has developed an incredible catalyst, which is the manganese atom in the leaf, in the plant itself. So it pulls out manganese from the earth, manganese acts as a catalyst, and the catalyst is needed to lower the activation energy of these reactions. Uh, so the activation reaction of these to fix carbohydrates, in other words, to convert carbon dioxide into a hydro carbon carbohydrate, the activation energy is very large in nature. It's very large. And the voltages and the energies you can get from photons coming from the sun are typically the band gap of semiconductors, which is 1 to 2 EV, 1 to 2 electron volts. It's very difficult to achieve. So you need a catalyst. And the research in this area is a combination of finding semiconductors and finding catalysts that can drive this reaction. And a number of labs have made remarkable breakthroughs in this area. Uh, and so the conceptual picture is to have a slurry uh, where these semiconductor dots are just dispersed. And light is shining at the end of the slurry, slurry you're pulling out fuel. And the fuel could be hydrogen, which is a very simple process, hydrolysis. But the fuel could be fully developed biofuels, fuels that are used in the car, for example, ethanol uh, and, and those kind of fuels, but doing basically this photosynthesis through this process. And semiconductors, so these are not traditional semiconductors, a lot of uh, new semiconductors, titanium oxide, um, cadmium-based uh, semiconductors, including also silicon uh, semiconductors are being used here. This is not a technology which is here now, but there's a huge uh, push in this technology from a number of sources, including Department of Energy, to find the right semiconductor combination at low cost. So these are not crystalline semiconductors. They are basically just little grains of semiconductors. Now, next was lighting. So I'm going to finish up very quickly. Lighting is an important area where semiconductors are making an impact. Um, so if you look at lighting, and this is a, a chart from a university in UK where they produce this and I have the source at the back. So if you look at lighting in incandescent light bulbs, if you look at 188 joules, out of which only 35% is converted, this is the Carnot limit, this comes from thermodynamics, to produce electricity. 
Uh, out of that electricity, only 1.35 joules, actually it's watts, they call it joules, uh, actually goes into the lighting part and the rest of the 98% is wasted. So you can see out of 188 joules per second or watt, only 1.35 actually goes into light. All the rest is wasted. Everything else is wasted. Now if you go to fluorescence, uh, you have to start out with lower because those are more efficient systems. For out of 47 joules, 1.35 goes into light. It's still enormous loss. Right? And some of this, we c there's nothing we can do about because the source itself is burn, burn of fuel. When you burn a fuel, that's a loss set by thermodynamics. There's not much we can do. Right? Um, <clears throat> here is a uh, so solid state lighting is becoming very important. That's a semiconductor system based on indium nitride, gallium nitride, aluminum nitride. Uh, and that system allows one to obtain both blue light and green light. And if you have a blue light source, uh, you can produce green and red from it. And so that's, what the, that's the basis of the white light, white LED uh, that we have in an arbor streets. Um, and that system is becoming quite important. And the, uh, this is the the best, now, right now there are some challenges in this technology, but this technology is becoming very important. And in fact, it's less corrosive uh, because fluorescents are also, they produce a lot of residue uh, because a lot of very dangerous systems are used in it. But uh, the LED system is becoming more efficient than fluorescent and gradually, of course this is a technology that is coming up and it's developing with a much higher efficiency uh, because light is one of the most wasteful use of energy. So better lighting systems are very, very important. Uh, and this is a chart from Department of Energy of how they expect uh, solid state lighting, which is this green, to penetrate the lighting market as time passes. Right? So you can expect about, say, 30% uh, by year 2016. So this conversion is occurring and semiconductors are playing the important role because it's all based on the nitride technology. Then a quick uh, uh, overview of the smart grid technology because a lot of electricity is wasted because of the grid, how the grid is used and managed. And in the grid management, a very important role of semiconductors is quick switching, fast switching of high voltages. So we're talking about high voltage switching, but very fast. So sensing the need in different parts and then switching electricity according to it. Uh, and which is projected to be very beneficial. Uh, so this, this is being inserted in some of the technology. Now the technology that is behind it is also the nitride technology that I just mentioned. So gallium nitride is a large band gap semiconductor and it can stand high voltages, in fact a 5 micron transistor, which is what you need. You need a fast transistor. You can't have a slow transistor. Right? Uh, we have technology for slow transistors which can handle high voltages, but they're very, very slow. So you need technologies that can switch in less than um, microseconds, in fact quite a bit less than microseconds. And nitrides, a 5 micron nitride device can handle 1 kilovolt of voltage which means it can stand two megavolts per centimeter field, which no other semiconductor can. So it's starting to approach not quite the vacuum level. Right? So a lot of the transformers are still based on good old basically big breakdown of the air. So gallium nitride is not at the point of air breakdown, but it's getting very close and it's very fast because it's a semiconductor technology. Right? So you can in fact have high power gallium nitride devices working at gigahertz switching high power. And that's a very important technology development, both for smart grid as well as uh, uh, electric vehicles, because there also you have to switch high voltages. Then there are unique opportunities in less developed countries, right, where the existence of a competing technology is not there. Right? So here's a school in Botswana, and uh, this is in, in a village in India. And this uh, lady was the first woman who was trained in India as a solar engineer to run solar energy projects in villages all over uh, in northern India. Uh, so there, of course, there's no existing technology. And even bringing in 
one kilowatt capacity to a village makes a huge difference in the quality of life. Okay. So you can have communication systems there, you can have education systems suddenly, uh, because education can be remote. Right? So if you have a smartphone or a laptop, you have power sources, you can be educated, you can access anything anywhere. So its impact of semiconductors in energy and its use is very profound in uh, less developed countries. Uh, of course, technology is also there, and this is part of the technology, remote healthcare. If you have a power source, then you can have a physician in a highly trained hospital helping physicians in less developed countries. Uh, and semiconductors play a role in all of that. And I'll end with this uh, final part, which is coherent com consumption, um, because we are challenged by the population. Everybody wants to have a good life. So incoherent consumption, uh, this question, if one person consumes one barrel of oil to live well, how many barrels will nine billion people consume? So that's a very important question. Uh, will they consume nine billion, half billion, or 100 billion? So that depends on how one consumes. And so I'll talk about this uh, three kinds of uh, processes, uh, three kind of cons styles of consum consuming. So the first journey, three kind of journey, do undo, you do something, then you undo it. Right? Or somebody else undoes it, does it. Uh, where you're just fighting yourself or fighting others. So this is a do undo style of doing things. And for example, if you're in a war, you can consume all the energy you want, nothing gets done. Uh, if, you, if there's a civil war in a country, no matter how much energy and resources are put in, there's no progress. Because that's a do-undo lifestyle, so you accomplish nothing. But we can do, have this lifestyle in our lives too. Part of the reason our healthcare expense is so high is, so in this country we spend $2 trillion on healthcare. Right? And most of it is a lifestyle, do-undo lifestyle. If you do something good for yourself, then you do something bad for yourself. Uh, so that's one style. Then there's an incoherent journey where every event is unrelated to the previous event. So this is incoherence, and mathematically we say this is incoherence. Uh, here, so in the first case, one plus one plus one and so on is zero. Nothing gets done. In the second case, something gets done. One plus one plus one produces n. But in the third case, coherent journey, uh, which is the basis of lasers and many coherent systems, one plus one plus one produces n square. Right? So two people working in harmony produce four times two people working in disharmony. So this is a very important role, uh, and if the whole world has to share resources, one has to work in this coherent system where, uh, and, and just as an example, a kilowatt laser can cut through steel. Right? A kilowatt of an, an incoherent light source hardly warms you. Right? So you can have a couple of kilowatts of uh, you know, a hot lamp and you stand in front of it, it warms you up. A few kilowatts of uh, laser power can cut through steel because that's a coherent system. So if the journey is known, if the destination is clear, the coherent journey is the most useful journey and it's the most efficient journey. Right? So it satisfies all the efficiency rules which means it produces no residue, uses the max, produces the maximum fruit. So since I'm getting close to the end, now to produce a coherent journey, you have to maintain phase. Right? So because that's part of uh, uh, mathematics of coherence, that everything has to be in phase. And how is phase produced in our real life? Right? So an example of a coherent journey would be, um, I exercise in the morning, I have a great breakfast, then I have good interactions with people, I get a lot of rest at night, that's a coherent journey, and I won't need the hospital. An incoherent journey would be I exercise in the morning, then I eat french fries for breakfast, and um, then I you know, fight with my colleagues, um, fill up my body with stress, can't sleep at night, and that's an incoherent journey. So, uh, now technology is an important part of coherent journey, and the next lecture I'm gonna give, which is next week, is what kind of technologies can produce these coherent journeys? Because the energy cost of a coherent journey is minuscule compared to the energy cost of an incoherent journey. Right? So right now, almost all our consumption worldwide is incoherent. And you can show it thermodynamically also. Right? So today, uh, preventable lifestyle cost, which means incoherence in the journey, is almost half of our economy. 
Right? So if you look at the economy of almost any country, and you say, okay, this is the economy. Economy in our country is about $15 trillion. What part of the economy is in, falls in the category of incoherence? And you can do this simple analysis, and you find almost half the costs are just undoing things that we did because we were not in coherence. So technology can have a huge impact uh, in that, and we'll talk, I'll, I'll talk about technologies which are possible uh, with semiconductors which will allow these coherent journeys. Simple example of coherent journey, now these are just as metaphors I use, a GPS system which minimizes getting lost. It's a simple system. If you're driving from here to visit a relative and you have no idea where the roads are, what the exits are, you can waste so much energy to get there. If you have a GPS system, uh, it makes a good GPS system. Like a good GPS system. This is a backup camera. Uh, recently, the US car industry uh, rejected having backup cameras. Now, in some countries, you go to some countries, these are just standard practice in every car. It's amazing in the US, which is an advanced technology country, there are no backup cameras. So the US in the auto industry postponed this to 2014. And every week, four children die because parents or relatives back up onto them. Right? So it's a simple technology. And imagine the sorrow and the grief of backing up on your child. But that does happen. Right? So, and uh, this, this came up last week. Uh, and it was rejected to force the auto industry to have backup cameras. Uh, it's a simple, it only costs about $50. Okay. And there are about uh, four deaths every week because of that. Right? So one has to consider how powerful this, this is a simple, coherent technology. And I'll talk about these next week. Uh, then, of course, this is Nest. You may have heard of this. Uh, some of the work, people who work for Apple formed this company called Nest, and they produce Nest which is an automated system, which learning system, which learns your habits, learn your, learns your home use, and minimizes the energy. It just, you just put it there after a little while, it starts figuring out when do you leave your house, when you come back, and automatically adjusts your uh, home heating system. So waste. So these are all coherent systems. And we always end with a coherent uh, practice here. Uh, so hopefully if you're new, you'll participate as well. So let's uh, do some coherent laughter to finish up the talk. So please stand, stand up. And if you haven't done it, it's a lot of fun. If you've done it, you know what's going to happen. So we are going to do some yoga breathing. Right? So breathing according to yoga, which is coherence. Yoga in Sanskrit means coherence. Uh, so I'm going to first show you how to breathe. Uh, and the yoga breathing is you inhale through your nose. You press your abdomen out when you inhale. So don't breathe from your upper chest. Try to press your abdomen out. We'll raise our arms when we inhale, when we come back. We'll exhale. We'll do two of these just to practice, and then we'll do this, what these people are doing. So let's touch our fingers and thumbs, and stand very tall. The shoulders pull back, your chest open, then your throat open. And let's inhale, bringing arms up slowly. So inhale. And exhale back. Do once more. And see the phase of all the hands. And that's almost perfect. So next movement we'll do, we'll inhale just like we did. When we come back, we'll come a little quicker and we'll laugh as hard as we can on the exhale. So let's hear a coherent laughter. So let's inhale. Laughing as hard as you can. <laughs> and two more. <laughs> and one more. <laughs> and that was fantastic. That's coherent. So thank you so much for coming.